Amen. 2 Corinthians 11. Jared's already excited, ready for Sunday school this morning, I hear. 2 Corinthians 11. The deceptions are out there. Good morning. The deceptions and the deceivers are out there. They're out there in mass. And um, the, um, probably next week, I'm just kind of thinking ahead here. The best way to know the fake Jesus, the best way to know that is to know the real Jesus. Okay? Um, when you hand the clerk at the store a $50 bill, what's the first thing they do? They check it. They got a pen. And they put a mark on it. And if that mark, I don't know, I don't know what the mark's supposed to do. Does anybody know? If it's real, it turns a certain color. Okay? So they know immediately whether it's real or it's fake. And I'm telling you, if you know the real Jesus, you'll know the fake one. Amen? Amen, Jared. He's going to get excited. I'm going to, we might as well just get excited with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So anyway, uh, I'm, probably going to, I'm probably going to add some things to what I'm doing next week is just to get an understanding of who the real Jesus is. Um, and the, I think the most important thing that you need to know about the real Jesus is that he is God. Amen? Settle that in your mind. Because I'm telling you that every other cult in the world reduces Jesus to something lesser than Almighty God. Okay? They will. They'll, they'll take him down. I don't care if you take him down a notch. If you take him down a notch, you're not dealing with the same one. All right? And so just kind of keep that in mind. And I'll try to remember that throughout the week and, and add that to my notes. I, I, sometimes I spend so much time... Dealing with the fake stuff, need to focus on the true stuff. So anyway, 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And, and basically, verse 4 is saying exactly what I said. We learn, if we will learn the Jesus that Paul and the apostles preached, if we will learn and know the spirit that the apostles preached and taught about, if we will learn and know the gospel that was preached by these men, we will not be deceived by the fake one. We will not be deceived by it. The gospel is simple. You believe. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved. Every other religion attempts to add something a little bit more complicated to it than that. Oh, it's more than that. Oh, it's not just that. Oh, you've got to go and keep the law or you've got to do this or you've got to say these words or whatever than that. Don't believe that stuff. Don't believe that lie. Um, take your Bible, turn to what's up on the screen there, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And um, we're identifying, good morning, we're identifying the uh, fake Jesus, what the Bible says about the Antichrist. Yes? The YouTube feed? Plenty of audio up, up there? Okay, I'll have to tend to it later. Okay. Anyway, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let the man deceive you by any means. How many times do you find that in the Bible? Jesus said, let no man deceive. Be not deceived. Paul said it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He said, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
and that man of sin be revealed. And he's, here he's called the son of perdition. What is perdition? Does anybody know? I think I touched on this last Sunday. Perdition is hell. Okay, perdition is another word for hell. Now I want you to think about this. Um, and I've got it in my notes. I'm probably slipping ahead here, but Paul said that Jerusalem above, which is free, is the mother of us all. So I want you to think of the contrast. Christ comes down from heaven. Beast rises up from where? Hell, the pit. He does not come down from heaven. I had this misconception about the um, Muslim, their version of their, of their Savior coming back, the 12th Imam. And um, I had this version of him that he was going to come down from, from Allah and teach everybody Islam and turn the whole world over to Islam. And that wasn't true. I found out that their version of their Savior, their Messiah, is down inside of a well, down in a pit, down in the heart of the earth, stuck down there, and he's awaiting to climb up out of there so he can convert the world to it. I know I'm going, okay, I know who that is now. I know who that is. That's the same guy, okay? He's got a different identi identification, but it's the same guy down there. But anyway, their version of him is, is that when this 12th imam comes up out of that pit, out of that well, that he's going to... He's going to show everybody who Jesus really was, that all the Christians were wrong, and he's going to convert the whole world into Islam, all right? So anyway, perdition is hell. He was birthed of hell itself. That's his mother, all right? So just, you see the opposites here. Christ coming down from heaven, he's coming up from the heart of the earth, from hell itself. But then we have Jesus. I saw it bear record that this is the Son of God coming down from heaven. So we see the opposites here, all right? And really, what God is doing is God is making this real simple. He's making it very simple for us. He's not making the Antichrist so close to Jesus that we'll hardly tell the difference. Like looking at two twins. You got twin, identical twin children. It's hard sometimes even for the parents to know the difference between them, okay? He's not telling us it's going to be that hard. He's going, to, he's going to show you that it's the difference between looking at night and day. Okay? It's that, it's that much of a difference. Christ is going to come down from heaven. He's going, to, he's going to be, you know, puked up from hell or whatever. So he's telling you how, how simple this is going to be. Zechariah chapter 11, in contrast with John chapter 10. John chapter 10 says, in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Think about that. Because the Antichrist is going to demand that everybody give up their life for him. In fact, he's going to demand that anybody who won't worship him is going to have their head cut off. Okay? Human sacrifices. These religions around the world, including Islam, the reason why these terrorists are blowing themselves up is that their God tells them, kill yourself for Allah. Whereas Jesus says, I sacrifice myself for you. Okay, you see the difference here. So he says in Zechariah, we have the good shepherd in John 10, which giveth his life for the sheep. And then in Zechariah 11, verse 17, woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. You see the difference. This one gives his life for the flock, the sheep. The idle shepherd leaveth the flock. He don't care. He don't care about anything but himself. How many of you know somebody like that? People, a bunch of people like that. Spirit of Antichrist. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. So you see all these rock stars and all these people posing for pictures like this. How many of you have seen that? It's all over the place. Or they're doing this deal here. Okay, I had to take my glasses off so my palm print wouldn't smear my glasses. But God has put out his right eye, and his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Think of the, the contrast between your right and your left, uh, the right and left side of your body. My right side is where my strength is. 
okay? If I'm going to hit you, I'm going to hit you with my right hand. Trust me, that's all I got, okay? I, I, don't, I can't do much with my left hand. That's the weak side. Look at your Bible, okay? The right side of your Bible is where the strength is. That's where the New Testament is. Left side of your Bible, that's where the law is. The law is weak, Paul said. The law cannot save you, okay? What's the matter? You're left-handed. Sorry, Jack. 300 years ago, they had to burnt you at the stake. 300 years ago, your mama would have tied your left hand behind your body and said, you're going to be right-handed, okay? They tried, okay? But anyway, you get the idea, okay? The right hand is, is the hand of power. Jesus sits, sits on the right hand of God. God has a book in his right hand. And that's the, that's the word of God. So all these people that are posing for pictures, covering their right eye, okay? They may not fully understand what they're doing. But if you read the Bible, you get it, okay? They're snuffing out and closing off the gospel of Jesus Christ, by His grace are you saved, God's pure love to go back under the curse of the law. All right? So the idol shepherd. By the way, here he is. You have to look up on the screen. Here he is. That is your idol shepherd. That is the idol, and he's supposedly Jesus. But I'm telling you, it's not Jesus. I don't like that. I hate those things. I hate them. I don't, I just, every time I go in one of these hospital rooms out here to see them, I'm just going, man, I want to rip that thing down. Okay? I ain't kidding you. That's idol worship. You, you have not seen, unless you've been in a Catholic church or been in one of their ceremonies or been in one of their towns, over in Europe or South America, where they'll parade that thing through up and down the streets and everybody's bowing and kneeling to the crucifix. That's corrupt. Amen? That is pure idolatry and wickedness, and God hates it. By the way, who said Jesus looked like that? Okay? We didn't see the similitude. The pe people who carved that out did not see a similitude of who Jesus was. They have no idea who that is. Now, I've got a little theory that says, I think the Antichrist is going to look like that guy there. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I believe it. They're kissing Baal. That's Baal. Okay? And in the days of Elijah, if you remember, Elijah was very... Um, after his, his run-in with Jezebel, he's very down, and, and God told him, he said, don't worry, Elijah. He said, I've reserved 7,000 that have not kissed Baal, okay? And so I believe it. You're looking at Baal worship when you see the Roman Catholic system, but it's not just the Roman Catholic system. It's all these, they, there's idol worship everywhere, all right? But anyway, that's the idol shepherd there. That's how you can tell the difference between the real Jesus and the fake Jesus. Okay? That thing is dead. Still dead. And every uh, Roman Catholic mass is a re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it just, it bugs me to no end. Okay? By the way, I was, I was at, uh, I tweeted it the other day, I was at... Um, uh, the Goodwill store, and I always go right for the books to see what they got. People give up their old books, and there was a Catholic Bible there, a New American Bible. And uh, Chris Pinto found one here a few months ago before our Bible conference where this Catholic Bible had a list of the forbidden books, and that the King James Bible was at the top of the list. They specifically mentioned, well, in this one here, they had a... a, a, a a record, a little article in there about the history of the Bible. And it was, um, one section of it was titled the King James Bible. And I'm going, okay, let's see what they got to say about it. And sure enough, right at the top of the, of the first paragraph, they said that even many, even many Protestant scholars recognize that the King James has serious errors in its translation. And I'm going... Yeah, they don't want people reading the King James Bible. 
And you know what I say? Let's find some Catholics and give them one. Amen? Anyway, uh, there, listen, there's still some Roman Catholics out there that can be brought out. Who in here used to be Catholic? You were brought out, weren't you? Okay? God brought you out. So praise the Lord. We see What we see in the real Jesus, we see the opposite in the Antichrist. His birth. This is the birth of Christ. Isaiah 7. You can turn there. Matthew chapter 1. Turn there. The birth of Christ, he was born of a virgin. It's very important to remember. Okay? He's born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Does anybody happen to know in the Revised Standard Version what the, re, what the RSV says in Isaiah 7.14 concerning the word virgin? Does anybody happen to know that? It says a young woman. The Revised Version does not allow for Christ to be born of a virgin. That was the very... The Revised Virgin... The Revised Virgin. The Revised Version was the earliest attempts by Westcott and Hort to alter the King James Bible. Okay? And this goes all the way back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. But you clearly see in Isaiah 7.14 where they took... They didn't take the literal Hebrew. They took their interpretation of what they thought the Bible should have said or what they believed and put it in there. Jesus was not born of a virgin, according to them. He was born of a young woman. Okay? So there you see the, you see the spirit of Antichrist there. Any atten- when, you, when you remove the truth of Christ away, you no longer have Christ. You have something different than Christ, but you don't have Christ anymore. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Does anybody happen to know the Mormon version of the conception of Jesus Christ? Anybody know? Okay. Well, here's, here's what their belief is. They're, of course, they believe that you can have many wives. So they believe that uh, Jehovah had multiple wives on a planet called Cobal. And then he was given this planet and uh, that God himself, the Father, Jehovah, came down to this planet, knocked on Mary's door, when she opened the door, he went in unto her like a man would. That's not the same Jesus. You see what they're doing? They've reduced who Jesus is. They reduce who God is. They reduce, they, they take away from the truth of the scriptures. The Bible does not say that. The Bible, your Bible does not say that. The Bible does not say the Holy Ghost mated with Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be... She was still a virgin after that deal. Okay? Now I don't want to get too explicit in the language here. It's not right. But I'm just telling you, the corruption that exists in all these other cults and all these other weird religions, they reduce down from the truth of the Scriptures. Be on guard, people. Have your shield of faith up, ready to go. Ready, ready to go on the attack after the, the fiery darts that are being shot at you to try to get you to believe something that the Bible says is not true. Amen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed. Christ is after the working of the Holy Spirit. Christ is after the working of the Holy Spirit. Think about you. How was Christ formed in you? 
by the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit got a hold of you. The Holy Spirit convicted you. The Holy Spirit uh, brought guilt down upon your soul about your sins. The Holy Spirit caused you to confess your sins to God. The Holy Spirit taught you the Bible. The Holy Spirit shows you things, reveals things to you, reveals who the real Jesus is, who the real God is, who the real Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit reveals those things to you. God working in you and Christ being formed in you is after the working of God's Holy Ghost through the Word of God. Amen. Look at the Antichrist. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Capital W. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the spirit of the Lord's mouth? It's a sword. If you look in Revelation 19, what is it that's coming out of the mouth of Jesus? A sword. Which is what? The Bible. How can you destroy the spirit of Antichrist? Destroy it with the Bible. How can you destroy false doctrine? Destroy it with the Bible. How can you... I'm not, I'm not all for trying to win arguments with people. If, if I can just gently convince somebody with Scripture then I'm all for that. But getting into arguments and trying to win arguments with Scripture, I'm just not really into that, okay? I'm not much of a debater. But if someone says something to me and tries to convince me of some kind of lie, and I know the Bible contradicts that, then I will say that, that is the, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible contradicts what you just said. I had a guy that came here out of the blue. He was living in his car. And he kept wanting to bring his computer system in here and link it into our network. And I went, now I'm not going to let you do that. I don't know who you are. And Michael was kind of waiting in the wings behind, just kind of behind a doorway watching over me because we didn't know who this guy was. He's a big guy. But he said, God told me to come here and show you something. I said, well, okay. And I was downstairs listening to him and he started spouting off a bunch of stuff and I went, hold on a second. And I don't remember what he said. I said, but let me tell you something. I said, what you just said right there is not true, biblically. And I gave him the verse. And he said, well, you've got to hear the rest of it. I said, no, I don't. I said, not until we get, to this, get past this issue here of what you just said. If, are you going to stick with that? He said, yeah. I said, I'm telling you, according to such and such and such and such, what you just said, it wasn't true. And the more I said that, the more edgy he got. And at some, I think the Holy Ghost said, Mike, pull back retreat and I just kind of let him talk for a while and I finally said sir I'm not I'm not buying it and I could tell he was getting pretty upset with me so he grabbed all his stuff and walked out the door I hate doing stuff like that but I can't let somebody I can't I can't just say well you know maybe that's your truth but I can't do that okay the Bible's right amen let God be true and every man a liar amen so anyway so then shall that wicked be revealed and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. How do, think about that. Go into a dark room, shut the door. How do you destroy the power of darkness in that room? Turn light on. Okay? In somebody's life, how do you destroy the power of darkness in their life? Turn light on. Now, if they are of, if they, if, if God is working in them and dealing with them, they will be drawn to that light. But if they have a dragon, evil, wicked spirit in them, you turn the light on, what are they going to do? They're going to run. Okay, just like cockroaches, just like mice, just like any kind of other varmint. When you turn the light on, they scatter. Okay, so you think about that. You shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Right now, Satan is working. He's working in movies and we'll talk a little bit about that he's working in TV shows he's working in books amen he's working in um, social media big time okay the devil has a Facebook account trust me I think 
he's on my friends list. He's got to be somewhere in there. <clears throat> but the devil knows how to use all this stuff. And he is working right now. He's everything that you see happening in science, technology, media, politics, banking, religion. Everything that you see going on in this world that you know is corrupt, that is the working of Satan. And he's bringing about a situation where the beast can arise. Right now, he probably can't. It's not time yet. But God, God is allowing Satan to bring this to bear, to bring it to fruition. It's going to serve God's purpose. It's going to be part of God's overall plan. But he's got to bring these things, okay? Um, I'm very, I'm upset. I'm a baseball fan, okay? And I'm not so much a, an NFL fan. And if I, if I have to sit through another NFL player taking a knee during the national anthem. But now, they had it this morning. They showed a, a um, um, Oakland A's baseball player took a knee during the national anthem. They ought to be fired. They ought to be you, listen, you signed a $98 million contract. Go home. Go play for the Canadians. Okay? And lay down for them or whatever. I'm just... And what the thought that came to my mind is we're unraveling as a nation. It's unraveling. It's not... We're not being... We're not holding together very well in this country. Amen? I don't like to talk that way. But I think very, very scary days are ahead of us. Hang on to this Bible, people. Hang on to it. It's all you got, all right? Because God is allowing Satan to do his work everywhere and allowing him a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more in order to accomplish this. You think of Judas. God allowed Judas to do what he did. Jesus knew who Judas was. The other disciples didn't, but Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was. He knew what he was going to do. He didn't stop him. He allowed him to do it because he knew that it fulfilled the purpose of his father. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, was going to have him turned over to the Roman soldiers. He was going to be you know, crucified and all that. So he knew that it was going to accomplish the plan of God for that to happen. So he allowed it to happen. And so just get, get used to the idea that we have not seen the worst of it yet. Okay, we have not seen the worst of it yet, all right? But that Antichrist, he is the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. We talked about that in um, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18. You see it in other places in the Bible. But watch out for the signs and the wonders. Watch out for the miracles. Satan can do things that can blow your mind, okay? Satan can do things. He can do tricks. He can do magic. He can do things that would just get people really freaked out, all right? Signs and wonders. There's been Catholic priests that have done signs and wonders, okay? There are Catholic churches where they speak in tongues. Catholic churches where they sprinkle them with holy water and they are slain in the spirit. They fall backward. Okay? That's a deception. And what that's done is that has linked then the charismatic movement and a lot of the Pentecostals in with Rome. So much so now that Pope Francis is in office, now you have Kenneth Copeland, you have all these charismatic leaders going to have breakfast with the Pope and talk about what a great, wonderful man he is. Are you kidding me? That's the Antichrist. Okay? He's the, I want to tell you, he is the vicar of of Christ. In Catholic terms, that means he is the replacement for Jesus Christ here on this earth. Okay? That's an, that's an abomination to anybody that believes the Bible. So signs and wonders being done. All right? When they went to Jesus, what did they want? They wanted signs and wonders. Okay? They wanted lying signs and wonders. Now, turn your Bible to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, something through the Bible. It's going to take a, it's going to take a, you know, maybe next Sunday we should be through with it. But we're going to look at a, a phrase in the Bible. 
that deals with the meaning of Genesis 3, all right? Genesis 3 is where sin was introduced into the earth, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Eve fell for it, she talked Adam into it, he did eat, and now sin has entered into the world. Willful disobedience to God. And now um, there's a curse placed upon Adam, upon Eve, and upon the serpent. And he says to the serpent, in verse 14, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity. And by the way, have you ever seen a serpent go about on his stomach? What's he doing with his tongue? Okay? You know what he's doing? He's tasting the air. What's in the air? Particles. Particles of dust, dust from people, okay, the aroma from people, the, uh, different particles in the air from different animals, that's how they find them, but he's literally licking and eating the dust, that's what they do, that Bible's right, amen, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity, that means a warfare, a constant, um, a constant battle between thee and the woman. Think of the woman here as the church. There should be a constant enmity between Bethel Church and Satan. We should be fighting him every day. We should be hating him every day, despising him and not serving him, not yielding to him, not giving in to him, not turning things over to him. Not going back to him. There should be a warfare going on every day. A battle. Okay? And uh, if, it takes, if it takes God letting you get beat up every now and then, then so be it. Because what it'll do is it'll just make you that much more angry at him. And you'll say, listen, I've had enough of you. Amen? I have had enough of you. All right? But I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between... Now notice this between thy seed and her seed. I remember reading this, and I accepted the literalness of what it was saying. We ex scholars have always said that the seed of the woman is Christ, and that it was a literal seed, and we all believe that. They said, well, the seed of the serpent, that's not really what that, it doesn't really mean an offspring or a generation. I disagree. If it means it in one place in the verse, it means it in the other place in the verse. The idea that Satan has a son and offspring, I believe it. Paul called a man by the name of Elimus the sorcerer, thou child of the devil. Okay, And I believe he meant what he said. And we're going to look into that. We're going to look into the nature. There's a phrase in the Bible called sons of Belial or children of Belial. Study that in your Bible this week as we prepare for Sunday school, all right? But look at, find out who Belial, Belial's Satan. He's Lucifer. He has the name Bel in his name, which is Baal, all right? And when you study that out, study it all through the Scripture, you'll find children of Belial, and you'll find out who they are, their nature, their character, what they, how, how they work, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for this book. God, feed us with knowledge. Lord, this may with some people that may not have uh, may not have tickled their fancy it may not have uh, given them an emotional explosion but father it's just simple knowledge knowledge is the basis of understanding and these are the basis of wisdom and father we pray god that you would give us wisdom in our lives help us father to fight the fight the devil every day father i hate him i hate what he's done to me i hate what he's done to my family i hate what he's done in this church I hate what I see him do in people's lives. Every time somebody dies, God, I hate it. I hate the devil. I hate his kingdom. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would equip us to fight him every day. Father, help us to understand that there is a constant daily battle that we, as your children, must fight. Teach us, dear God, to do warfare, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, Amen.